Good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are. I'm going to be talking about what we can learn by analysing data collected in clinics from several countries around the world uh, on the listening in spatialised noise sentences test and a couple of other tests towards the end. I'm really interested in listening difficulties, which is a bigger thing than just auditory processing disorders. Listening difficulties can be caused by hearing loss, whether you can see it in the audiogram or not, auditory processing deficits, many types, speech sound recognition deficits, cognitive deficits or language deficits. But in this talk, I'm really focusing in in the auditory processing area. Um, what's complicated about this whole picture is that any one of these can cause apparent deficits or maybe real deficits in the other domains. So the listening and spatialized noise sentences test is an adaptive test of speech and noise. Uh, as they get uh, the answer right, the sentence is correct, then the signal noise ratio is made more negative usually. Um, and we find the level at which people can just report back 50% of the words in the sentence, that is the speech reception threshold. The test itself is done under four different subtests. It's, uh, it's presented through headphones, but the different subtests differ in according to whether the target voice and the competing voice are the same person or different people, and whether the sounds appear to be coming from all the same direction, directly in front, or from different directions. Um, so these four subtests then differ according to those um, two categories. We can take advantage of them if there's subtle differences between the tests by looking at difference measures. And the difference measure then tells us, for example, this one, it tells us about the ability to use spatial cues because that's the only difference between these two conditions. Whereas the only difference between these two conditions is the ability to use different voices to detect um, the target. This is the test that's given first, the test where it's conditioned where there are both different voices and uh, different directions. So it's the most realistic of the conditions. Uh, our recommendation is that if that test, that first subtest, uh, gives a score that indicates there's a problem, like uh, scores more than one standard deviation below normal for that age, then give the rest of the test because it gives us an opportunity to look for uh, spatial problems or uh, talker problems in detecting the target. It's important to be able to find the cause. Uh, we know that spatial processing disorder is caused by uh, otitis media, um, and it's a very common consequence of it. Uh, we know that we can diagnose the spatial processing disorder with LISN-S, and we know we can remediate it, completely remediate it, with a computer game currently called Soundstorm, uh, which is played um, five days a week for about 10 to 12 weeks, for about 10 or 15 minutes a day. Uh, and that leads to a sustained improvement that's noticeable by people in real life. Um, we've got research backing up all of those links in the chain. Uh, coming pretty soon is a new version of or new type of training program that doesn't require English. It's called going to be called Matchamos, uh, and it's quite a fun game and it uses nonsense syllables which uh, apply in many languages. Listen S used to be provided by Phonak, uh, commercialized by them, which we're very grateful for. But after about 10 years, uh, they stopped that and it's now being released by Sound Scouts. Uh, and it, it's a bit different. It's uh, the test itself works the same, but the way you access it is totally different. It's based on a, um, a web based server. So you access it from your browser. And a consequence of that is that all of the um, all of the test results are actually stored on that server, and I'll be analysing them in an anonymous manner uh, in for this presentation. So, of all of the cases that um, 2,600 roughly cases that were on the server when I looked at this a, a week or two ago, um, there are more or less half where there was a definite problem um, in the uh, in the high Q condition, that is, as a speech and noise deficit, and a bit more than half where there uh, was not. So, our recommendation is that when there's not a problem you, um, this, is this column, when there's not a problem, you don't carry out the full test, and that was pretty commonly done. And when there is a problem, you do carry out the full test. But in all of these cases, the reason for a deficit was not investigated, which means that the uh, person lost the opportunity to find some potential reasons. Um, and in these cases, there wasn't really a problem. The, the score was well and truly in the normal range. Uh, so basically, uh, some time was wasted in doing that testing. 
Mostly, the test is being used in the manner that we actually originally intended it, which is for testing people with normal pure tone thresholds, but it absolutely can be used for people with elevated pure tone thresholds, and I'll say a bit more about that at the end. The analysis I'm showing today is of people with normal pure tone thresholds. It looks like it's been applied to people from the ages of about four up to about 80. Um, and that's reasonable. Maybe four is a stretch. We've got normative data down to six. Actually, we've got it down to five, um, and I'm comfortable with that. Uh, four is, is a bit young, um, but going up to 80, we've got normative data up to age 60, and it is normal to see some deterioration with age above that. We can uh, change these scores from dB signal to noise ratio down to uh, Z scores, which shows the score relative to normal hearing of people of the same age with no problems. So scores below minus two, we generally regard as a problem well outside the normal range. And even scores below minus one, which is about in here on that graph, uh, you're starting to get suspicious that the person may be having problems. If we look at that distribution of Z scores for the high Q condition, so that's the overall measure of speech and noise ability. Um, and this is a so-called violin plot. Uh, showing the distribution of scores, showing that scores around zero, that is around normal, are very common. Uh, but look at all of the scores that are below minus two, that is below two standard deviations, worse than two standard deviations below the mean. By contrast, there's very few that are better than plus two, as you would expect. In fact, 41% are worse than minus one, and 24% are worse than minus two. This tells us there's a problem, very often when listen S has been applied in these clinics, it doesn't tell us anything about why. But we can ask that question because in many cases, as you saw, they gave the full, the full range of subtests. Here is the results for the spatial advantage measure. So it's the difference between the scores when, or the signal to noise ratio, when uh, there were spatial cues and when there were not spatial cues. And that was the only difference between the two conditions. And again, we see quite a range of scores, uh, in fact, 20% of the scores were, had this deficit in ability to use spatial cues. Um, we call that spatial processing disorder. Um, it gets worse if you not look at all of the cases where the full test was delivered, but just look at the cases where the high Q condition was poorer than minus two. So these are people with a definite deficit in speech and noise ability of those roughly half of the people had this deficit as well in spatial processing ability. We can look at that as a more conventional XY plot. And on the horizontal axis, we've got that ability to use spatial cues with a range from minus two to plus two given by these red dash lines. And on the vertical axis, we've got overall speech and noise ability, again, with a range from minus two to plus two. And you can see that there's a very strong relationship. If you have a deficit, in ability to use spatial cues, then you have a deficit in speech and noise ability. If the converse is not always true, if you have a deficit in speech and noise ability, meaning below the red line, then you might or might not have a deficit in spatial advantage. That is, it's not the only cause um, of a speech and noise deficit, it's not by a long way, but it is a very common cause. And that's the main message of this talk. I'll just remind you that these scores are coming from different tests. The vertical axis is coming from the scores on this condition, and the horizontal axis is coming from the difference between the scores on these two conditions. So for every 100 people who are tested with uh, the listen as test, um, let's look at what happens to them. 3%, uh, great performance, better than two plus two standard deviations. Another 9%, good performance, better than one standard deviation above average for their age. Let's look at the other end. Uh, poorer than minus two, well, actually there's 24% of those have got that, um, and another 17% who are poorer than minus one, leaving this uh, reduced number, about half the people who are in the middle range. We can go further and say, well, but of those people with those degrees of problem, how many had spatial processing disorder? And the answer is, for the uh, bottom range here, the people who had uh, more than two standard deviations below, half of those, it's, sorry, it's probably behind my picture there, but it's, it's half of those. And for the next range between minus one and minus two in overall ability, it's 12% uh, of them. For 
the people who have got average or better than average performance, it's very, very few. Only 3% of these appear to have spatial processing disorder. That's why we have our recommendation that if the score is below minus one, do the rest of the testing. If the score is better than minus one, don't bother. You'll be wasting your time. I'd like to compare those spatial advantage scores. This is the same picture you saw before with the talker advantage scores. Really, there's almost nobody who's got a talker problem. And there's a problem in using differences in voice quality to segregate the target from the speaker. And both of these are consistent with our earlier research. But I'll just repeat, these are all results from clinics, anonymous results from clinics uh, around the world, English speaking countries. Um, for the mathematicians amongst you, I, I thought you might be as interested in this as, as I was. We can do a mathematical decomposition of that uh, distribution of spatial advantage. And look what happens when you ask it to just pick two Gaussians that best approximate that. You get one Gaussian with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. That is people with no problems. That's what you expect of the typically developing population. And a second one with a mean way down at minus two and a standard deviation of 2.4. Um, okay, curious, just curious maths. ListenS is not the only test on the portal. There's um, also the ListenU, which is listening in spatialized noise universal. This uses language independent. Well, most languages, it's independent, uh, nonsense syllables. So it opens up testing for people whose first language is not English. The dichotic digits difference test, which is um, I'll say a bit more about, and Digispan, which is a test of working memory. And as of a week or two ago, when I downloaded the data, that's how many uh, cases there were of each of these. Digispan only got put on the portal um, a few weeks ago, so I'm pretty happy with, um, with that number using it already. The dichotic test is when a person hears one sound in one ear and a different sound in the other ear and has to repeat them both back. Uh, in this particular test, the dichotic digits test, there's a pair of sounds and then a second or two later, another pair of sounds and they have to repeat back all four. We uh, made a control condition for that, which we call the dichotic digits difference test, where there's also a dyotic condition where all four sounds are in this ear and all four sounds are in this ear. And again, the person repeats them all back. And when we look at the distributions across these scores on the uh, on the server, uh, we see quite similar uh, pattern of scores. Not only are the distributions similar, but the relationship between the two is really strong. This is the score on the dichotic condition. This is the score on the dyotic condition. If you're bad at one, you're almost always equally bad at the other. Um, this reinforces what we saw with our research where we pulled some children out of school and we got a small amount of clinical data um, where we saw again quite a strong correlation between the two sets of scores. I, I'm fairly sure that most of what's being measured on the dichotic digits test is nothing about dichotic performance because we can measure the same the same result in most cases, not all, most cases with a dyotic condition where there are no, no ear differences between the ears. We'll come back to that in a moment. Memory. We recently introduced Digispan, which is a computer-based version of the Digitspan test. Um, it's got a few adaptive trials at the end, which increases the accuracy quite a bit and also provides a reliability metric. Um, and across these clinics, we see that on average, children are coming in, children and adults, but mostly children, are coming in with a score that's not hugely below normal, but somewhat below normal. So on average, children have got a memory deficit that are, who are coming in for these assessments. Um, and when we uh, look at the relationship between ListenS and dichotic digits, jumping around a bit here, in fact, I'll skip that one. We'll look at the relationship between dichotic digits and digit span memory. And what we see is quite a strong relationship that um, the numbers are fairly small yet, but generally uh, the worse your memory, the worse you do on the dichotic test. Uh, and that again echoes what we found with our research a couple of years ago, the worse the memory, the worse the score on the dichotic test, which is why we think that the dichotic digit test score is hugely influenced by uh, the child's memory ability. I mentioned earlier the listening and spatialized noise universal test, listen you. So it's got nonsense syllables made of consonants and vowels that are in most, but not all, most languages in the world. 
Again, it's an adaptive test where the signal noise ratio is changed. And here's results from Australian children in red, Turkish children at two different universities in green and blue, totally overlapped um, on top of each other, giving us some confidence that this indeed will be language independent for, I think, quite a few languages. And so for those of you who are in non-English speaking countries, um, then uh, the Listen U test is available to also measure spatial processing and hence uh, and hence uh, diagnose spatial processing uh, disorder. OK, we can test hearing impaired clients. The way it works is the audiologist puts in the audiogram uh, that dials up a prescribed gain amplifier, which gives a prescription based on the NAL R prescription. Uh, gain is applied to all of the stimuli and then the testing proceeds in just the same way. So summary is spatial processing disorder. It's a very common cause of speech intelligibility deficits in noise. Most clinicians are using it in the way we recommend, but in some of the time uh, it's being the full test is being given when it serves no purpose and it's not being given sometimes when it would be uh, very useful to do to give. Um, Children seem to commonly have a deficit on digit span uh, testing, not always, but commonly. And we think that the poor scores that you often observe on the dichotic digit test are associated with poor short term memory uh, because the test is quite dependent on memory. OK, there's a bunch of publications in each of those areas that I've talked about, which you can see if you get the slides. And that's it from me.